Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Nalanjan Sarkar and I'm Deputy Director of the LSE South Asia Centre here at the London School of Economics in London. A uh, very warm welcome to all of you to the first event in Lent term uh, at our centre. And and uh, today's event is a very special event indeed. But before I say more about it, uh, a very warm welcome also to many of you who have um, signed up for this event. And uh, we hope all of you are going to have uh, an extremely interesting uh, time uh, listening to the lecture as well as to the discussion that follows. Our event this afternoon is indeed very special. At the South Asia Centre, we've been very lucky in that our centre is involved with a region that has had the opportunity to mark several landmark anniversaries in the last few years. All through 2021, from January to December, we marked 50 years of Bangladesh's independence. And from August of 2022, uh, we have been marking the independence of Pakistan and India. From January this year, we are marking the 75th anniversary, uh, independence anniversary of Myanmar. And from the 4th of February, we will be marking the 75th anniversary of Sri Lanka. So all in all, in the last few years, we've been blessed and privileged to have been able to mark the independence anniversaries of five countries in, in, in the region. We do several things to mark th this special year. Uh, we do events like today's event, which is an inaugural event to mark Myanmar at 75. Uh, we publish blog posts. We do one-off events uh, and, and a variety of other things, uh, which you can find the details of on our website. Our event this afternoon is one such event. The independence of Burma, now Myanmar, from British colonial rule on the 4th of January 1948 is what Today's lecture will talk about, focus on, and mark. As several of you may know, Aung San, whose daughter is the Nobel laureate Aung San Suu Kyi, was the central figure in the anti-colonial movement in Burma and is considered by most to be the architect of Burma's final and eventual independence. So we are extremely delighted to welcome our speaker this afternoon, Angeline Noor, whom I'll introduce shortly. But suffice to say here that Angeline is one amongst very few people uh, who has written an academic biography of Aung San and one that is available in the English language. But before I introduce Angeline, uh, as well as our discussant, I'd like to say a very warm wel welcome and to, to everyone who's watching us online, um, th this event, which is being live streamed on YouTube across various time zones. Uh, the, the number of people who have signed up, it literally covers the entire globe and people are watching this event from, from, from across about 12 time zones. And may I also mention that our center and me personally, we've been extremely um, encouraged by the interest that so many of you have shown in, in this event. The event itself is happening via Zoom, but is being live streamed on YouTube for the benefit of the audience. And YouTube can be accessed free. So as uh, you will see, we have enabled the chat function in YouTube. And please do ask questions. Um, via the chat function, and I will pose those questions at the end of the lecture and after the discussion to the speaker. You are equally welcome to ask questions to the discussant, Professor Michael Charney, whom also I will introduce just now. And if you would like to tweet, then please do tag us. Our Twitter handle is at SAsiaLSC, and we will uh, try and answer um, you know, anything, uh, anything that has been asked. We have, uh, the events live link has just been tweeted as well, and you will find the Twitter handle of Judson University, which is at Judson U, as well as uh, Mike Charney's uh, host department at SOAS History. All those appear in our tweet. So please do, um, uh, you know, catch on to that link if you would like to. Um, I should add here, for the benefit of those of you who are attending this event for the first time online and watching this on YouTube, that had this event been an on-site event at LSC, it, members of the audience at LSC events have the right to ask questions anonymously and without revealing their identity. Now, keeping um, 
remaining close to that spirit, uh, I when I ask questions that you have asked on uh, YouTube via the chat box, I will not be announcing the names of the people who have asked the questions. I know that your names may be visible to others, but that's a different matter. And at least we will try and remain as close to the spirit in which events are held on site um, at, at LSC. And as I said, you are very welcome to ask questions to either the speaker or the discussant or to both of them, and I will pose the questions, questions to them. It is now my very pleasant task to introduce the speaker as well as the discussant. Angeline Noor is Professor Emerita in History at Judson University in Elgin, Illinois in the United States. She's the author of Aung San and the Struggle for Burmese Independence, which was published in 2001. And as I mentioned a short while ago, is one of the very few academic and extremely readable biographies that is available in the English language. Um, Angeline has also very recently, as recently as this month, her other book, Monograph, has been published, The History of the Karen People of Burma, which has been edited by Jerry Kane, and its publication date is 2023 and is now available to buy. Our discussant this afternoon is Michael W. Charney, who is professor in the Department of History and the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy at the School of Oriental and African Studies here mm -hmm. in London. And Michael is a specialist in the history of South Asia. Southeast Asia. He is author of A History of Modern Burma, which was published in 2009, and more recently, The Imperial Military Transportation in British Asia, Burma 1941-1942, which was published in 2019. Now, just before we went live on air, Angeline, Michael, and I have had a brief chat, and I will now invite Angeline to make the lecture. Angeline will speak for about 40 minutes, after which Michael will start the discussion. Once again, you are very, very welcome to ask questions via the chat box. Please do hear out Angeline's lecture. There's a lot in it. Um, I've had the privilege of reading it. And um, we look forward to the discussion that is to follow after the lecture. Angeline, please speak now. Since this event is to mark the 75th anniversary of Burma independence, please allow me to greet you all Mingalaba in Burmese. For the rest of the friends in Asia, good evening, Europe, good afternoon, and good morning in the United States of America. According to 2022 reports, English is the most spoken language in this world. We cannot deny that English become the most common language because of imperialism. Until the middle of the 20th century, Burma was a portion of 84% the world Earth surface controlled by imperial powers. The British conquered Burma in three stages and after dethroning the King, King Thibome and sending him and his family into exile in India, they created the province of Burma in British India in 1886, with it becoming a major province in 1897. In Burma, as elsewhere in South and Southeast Asia, religion lent inspiration to the nationalist movement. Buddhism was one of the fundamental components of Burmese national identity. The dethroning of the king who the people revere as the chief promoter of the faith, meant for the Burmese people that the British were trying to destroy Buddhism in Burmese society. Unsurprisingly, most of the leader of the earliest anti-colonial movement were the Buddhist monk. By the end of the 19th century, other factors give stimulus to Burma's nationalist movement. The defeat of the Russian by the Japanese in 1904-1905, the growth of the Indian National Congress Party across the border and Marxist ideology. With the intention of stimulating nationalist sentiment, Western educated Burmese elite encouraged the study of Burmese history and Indian nationalist movement. Through the initiative in 1906, the Young Men Buddhist Association, YMBA, model on the YMCA was formed. 
within a decade by 1916 YMBE, which initially engaged only in social, religious, and cultural matter, thrust itself into politics. In 1920, the leaders merged YMBA with various patriotic organizations and named the new organization the General Council of Burmese Association, GCBA. They demanded the new administrative reforms granted to India in 1919 be applied to Burma as well. As a result, in 1923, the British extended the Montague Chanfort Daiki reforms and handed over certain limited functions of government to the Burmese people, making Burma a governor province. The British parliament had established the Daiki system of government in both India and Burma as a constitutional experiment for a period of 10 years only. In 1930, they appointed the Simon Commission to enact future, future reforms. Along with these reforms, came the plan for the separation of Burma from India. Some GCA BA leaders supported the continued attachment to India based on the fact that the Indian National Congress seemed to be rapidly approaching home rule, but others decided to campaign for a separatist policy. The 1930s proved a disastrous de decade for established political leader in Burma. By 1936, almost all the nationalist politicians had taken offices in the Burmese Legislative Council, which many followers consider an organization co-opted by the British. Seeing this as a betrayal by the politician, this country lost faith in their political leaders. In 1937, the British government separated Burma from India and granted her its own constitution independent of India. However, the senior politician mishandling of the issue of separation from India created a vacuum in the leadership of the Burmese national movement. And it was into this vacuum that new young patriots like Aung San stepped in. Where and when did Aung San find his inspiration to nationalist movement? Why has Aung San become one of the most important political figures in the history of Burma's struggle for independence. My talk today will touch upon only some of the reasons, and we can talk about some others if they come up in the discussion or question. Born to a family descendants of a Burmese patriot beheaded by the British, as a child, Aung San's dream was to rebel against the British. So he grew up a committed nationalist leader obsessed with the single goal, the independence of Burma. As a member of the student union, he often gave speech, speeches at union meeting. In one of them, he surprised his fellow student by saying that they should be concerned with the welfare of the country and search for ways to free the country from British bondage. Captivated by the political affairs of his country, even as a teenager, Aung San attended and studied the speeches delivered by political personalities. After listening to an address by the politician Uso Ting of the GCBA, he would later reproduce the speech, imitating the orator's gestures and repeated many of Uso Ting's words. He had strong views on controversial matters and did not shy from arising them. In 1932, as a freshman of Rangoon University, Aung San argued for the non-involvement of Buddhist monk in politics at the debate. Aung San's roommate in Bigu Hall had seen him go into the bushes and talk for hours. When asked, he said he was practicing giving speeches to the bushes, just as the British member of parliament, Edmund Burke did to water. In spite of all his all out efforts, Aung San Ascension to student leadership had to wait until he became the editor of OE, Peacock's Call, the Rangoon University Student Union's magazine in 1935. It was also the time when the Dubama CEO, the Burma, We Burma Association, the Kane Master Organization, founded by the Kane Bamao and the Kane Lemao in 1931, became popular throughout Burma. This leader formed the All Burma Youth League where Aung San Fren Unu and many students at Rangoon University joined them. 
An incident involving Aung San led to the 1936 student strike. Aung San's friend Unu, who was the president of Rangu University Student Union, delivered a speech on January 31st, 1936, accusing a member of the university staff of immorality. And Nu received an expulsion letter from the Chancellor J.D. Sloss on February 21st. Shortly after that, Aung San was also expelled because he refused to give the name of the author of an article titled Hell Hong at Large, published in OE, attacking a universal official, university official. The expulsion of Aung San and Nu triggered the strike of 1936. Richard Budwell, author of Unu of Burma, writes that Aung San expulsion caused greater indignation among the Sudan than Nu's. Prior to the strike, Aung San was hardly known beyond Rangoon University campus. With the name Aung San repeatedly appearing in daily newspaper during the university strike, Aung San became the political leader for the future. After graduating, Aung San formed the All Burma Student Union, ABSU, and in 1938 became the president of both Rangoon University Student Union and All Burma Student Union. In addition, the government appointed him as a student representative on the Rangoon University Egg Amendment Committee. Undoubtedly, the events surrounding the student strike of 1936 propelled Aung San into a prominent position as a student of leader of the country. Surendra Prasad Sen and some other historians regard 1938 as a turning point in Burma's independent movement. It was a year that British administration was threatened by the so-called Revolution of 1300, dated after the Burmese Gosa Thakurit calendar, led by the Doba Ma Siyong, where Aung San became a leader. Although the common goal of the DEA was the freedom of Burma, its leaders were divided into factions. In search for a place in national politics, in October 1938, Aung San decided to join the DEA faction led by the King Kuro of Mai and the King Teng Mao, saying that it was the only militant and intensively nationalist political party at the time. By the end of 1938, the anti-British the key movement was very active with the formation of a mass based workers, peasants, students, and even monks. DEA played a crucial role in the re revolution of 1300 between August 1938 and July 1939. This so called revolution of 1300 would become the most important rebellion in the history of Burma nationalist movement. Prime Minister Dr. Bamo was forced to resign on February 12, 1939 and a new ministry under Upu was formed. Aung San's role in the nationalist movement became more substantial when he could persuade other Burmese political parties to join him in forming the Freedom Bloc Party in 1939. He was elected, elected the party's general secretary, and when he drafted the rules, he claimed that Britain's war in Europe was Burma's opportunity and that the time had come to fight British imperialism. But his anti-British spe speeches were not limited to the Burmese people only. In 1940, he made an important appearance across the border where he attended the 53rd session of the Indian National Congress in Ramgad in India as the GAA delegation leader. Aung San met Gandhi, Nehru, Subhajandra Bose and other Indian National Congress leader. After the Congress, he and his group, uh, including Tan Chum, Bahain, Himal, and Singh Gupta, tour many Indian cities, telling the Indian people about the DAA. At Banaras Hindu University, he told his audience that he came to India to meet the Indian leaders and cooperate with the Indian people in fighting against the British. On April 2nd, 1940, Aung San told the people of Lahore that to gain independence, it would probably be necessary to sacrifice flesh and blood. Aung San also drafted the manifesto that DA presented to the conference in India, a very important document in the history of the Burma nationalist movement, serving as a charter of Burmese demand for independence of Burma 
and it declared, we stand for the complete independence of Burma, including the area excluded under the 1935 government of Burma Act from the present imperialist domination and exploitation and for the introduction of a free independent people's democratic republic. It also included the foreign policy which stated, we stand for friendly and business-like relation with any foreign nation, especially with those in our neighbors and the Far East in all possible matters. On returning from India, Aung San went immediately to the fifth annual meeting of the Duba Ma Siyung and presented the manifesto. When World War II started in Europe, the Burmese nationalist movement launched a vigorous nationwide campaign proclaiming that the difficulties of the British could be an opportunity for the Burmese nation. Under the umbrella of the Freedom Bloc, the kin from the Duma Siyung and other political leaders joined with the student, peasant, and workers organization to demand independence and to demonstrate against the war. As early as 18 November 1939, a branch of GAA organized the People's Revolutionary Party, advocating the use of any available means in the struggle against Britain. The King Aung San was selected as foreign liaison officer along with the Kenya. In early August 1940, Aung San left Burma with the intention of seeking help in China, but he was contracted, contacted by a Japanese Kempeitai, Japanese army in November, who promised to help the Burmese. The Japanese people to aid the Burmese was motivated by Japanese desire for a quick victory over China in order to achieve its objective. They needed to cut off all Western aid from reaching the Chungking government through Southeast Asia, much of which arrived via the Burma route. They were therefore willing to support the Burmese nationalists who in turn were desperately in need of foreign aid. It was on the, this basis of this mutual need that Colonial Suzuki and Aung San initiated their cooperation, cooperative relationship. And before the Japanese pushed into Southeast Asia, he had been appointed military leader of the Japanese trained Burmese Independent Army, which was later renamed the Burmese Defense Army. Soon after Japanese occupied Burma in 1942, Aung San was made the defense minister. During that period, Aung San became increasingly popular among his people who affectionately called him Bojo, it means Supreme General. And he became the subject of musical composition widely sung throughout the country. Despite his high military rank and recognition by the Japanese, Aung San started to prepare for resistance against the Japanese as he was convinced that the Japanese were not sincere with their promise for the independence of Burma. Crucial to his plan was allying with the current people who never severed their ties with the British. But the situation with the current people was not good. A bloody racial conflict in Miao Mia district in 1942 made the current regard the Burmese the king and the BI as their enemies. The incident occurred when the British were withdrawing from Burma in the work of the Japanese and the BIA military invasion. In the last day of March 1942, many disbanded current troops who had served in the British army returned to their homes in the Arawadi Delta region, carrying with them their army weapons. This coincided with a period in which the BIA was badly in need of firearms for the large number of new recruits. And since the BIA knew about the weapon in the possession of the Koran, they decided to seize them. A few villages had surrendered their arms to the BIA at the suggestion of some of the Koran leaders, such as Saw Peta, 
a former minister in the Burma government. However, afterwards, the villages were attacked and looted by well-armed gangs. Since the BIA was the only well-armed group operating in the area, the current people concluded that the BIA was behind the robbery and looting. A full-scale savage communal gang war then raged in Miao Mia district and spread to adjacent current area in Besin, Hendestad, and Piapo, killed many thousands of Korean people. Aung San was in Upper Burma when the Miao Mia incident occurred and was extremely distressed when he heard about the situation. The incident deepened racial resentment between the Korean and the Burmans. It was a difficult time to bridge <clears throat> the gap between the mounting hatred for the Japanese with the Korean community made the leader search for a way out. Without choice, the current leader, Saw Sam Pote, met Aung San in Rangoon in 1943, November. During the conversation, Saw Sam Pote said, referring to the Japanese, the people you brought are terrible, to which Aung San answered, yes, we need to fight them now. And when Saw Sam Pote said that he let the racial incident of 1942, Aung San replied with a broad smile, a brave enemy is a good friend. From this meeting, the reconciliation between the two ethnic groups began. They agreed that since Burma was in a critical state, they should put aside their all ill feelings they might have for each other and strive for unity. Aung San himself to the Delta area in September 1944 with his wife, Dokinchi and Bozeya, Bozeya Boleya, So Chadu and So Samputi and some other leaders. And during this, his tour, he always offered his apology for the misdeed of his men. During the month of August and September, 1944, Aung San initiated a clandestine anti-Japanese campaign. Several secret meetings were held in Rangoon. And in one meeting, the anti-fascist organization, AFO, later known as the AFPFL, and anti-fascist People's Freedom League was created through the proposal of Aung San, which called for countrywide resistance against the Japanese. Armed resistance began on 27 March 1945 in the AFO Manifesto. Aung San exhorted his people to fight the Japanese for freedom. Until then, he was not certain that he would get British support. Captain Takahashi, who was assigned to watch him closely, noticed that Aung San was planning something in his attempt to persuade Aung San to remain loyal to the Japanese, he asked Aung San what kind of deal he had made with the British. He recalled Aung San word, our deal is total independence for Burma. Aung San also gained the trust of British military commanders. Before any decision for the future of the Burma Nationalist Army was made, Aung San met General Slim at the latter's headquarters in Metila. Throughout these meetings, Slim and Aung San took adversarial position with Aung San repeating demands and Slim rejecting them. In the end, Slim found Aung San an honest man in his memoirs. Slim described his encounter with Aung San. I was impressed with Aung San. Aung San also won the support of Lord Louis Mountbatten, who was then the commander in chief of the Allied Army in Southeast Asia, who was planning to make Aung San Deputy Inspector General of the Burma Army with the rank of a Brigadier General. Aung San was only 30 when he earned the respect of all these leaders. In 1945, the British came back to Burma with the white paper policy, which mandated that Burma would remain under British rule for three more years. Aung San AFPFL became the major organization opposing the white paper policy. He and his AFPFL demanded complete independence and orchestrated serious political unrest. As a result, the British government agreed to revive the white paper policy and invited Aung San to London for final negotiation. On his way to London, Aung San stopped over in India and stayed at Nehru's house in Delhi from January 2nd to 6th, 1947. He attended many functions that Nehru had arranged for him. He showed his skill in international 
diplomacy during his stay in Delhi. Even though he had developed a close relationship with Nehru, he accepted an invitation from Liaquat Ali Khan, secretary of the Muslim League, the major political rival of the Nehru Indian National Congress Party, and also visited Jinnah and discussed matter relating to the boundary of Burma and East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. Aung San wanted to have good relationship with all neighboring countries and understood that the Muslim League would be the future leader of Pakistan, which was to become independent country in the foreseeable future, sharing a border with Burma. On 27 January 1947, Prime Minister Adli and Aung San signed the agreement on behalf of the United Kingdom and Burma, respectively. By this Aung San Adli agreement, independent to Burma was promised within one year. According to para 8 of the Aung San Adli agreement, the British and the Burmese were to achieve the early unification of the frontier areas and ministerial Burma within the free consent of the inhabitants of those areas. It was further agreed that a committee would be set up to find the best method of associating the frontier people with the working out of the new constitution for Burma. Aung San was the first Burmese political leader to concern himself with the problem of the country ethnic minority. As early as September 1946, in his speech, at the exclusion, at the conclusion of the Kandy Agreement, Aung San talked about the contribution of the Chin, Kachin, and Karen, and emphasized the fact that the Karen suffered the most during the Japanese occupation. He also added his intention to raise the living standard of the indigenous people, since he found that the condition of these people were far backward than the Burmese people. From 18 to 26 December in 1946, Aung San lodged a a tour of the Tanisrim division during his trip. He visited the Kapili, current village called Kapili, in the Plymboe district, where 20,000 people had gathered from all over the district, some even walking from across the Thai border. Aung San, dressed in a Korean long coat, was warmly welcomed by the Korean leaders. The crowd was impressed by his friendly words and by the modesty he showed by stepping down from the platform and standing to attention alongside the Korean leaders while the Korean national anthem was played. Through his word and conduct, Aung San captured the hearts of the Korean. Although many minority leaders believed in Aung San's sincerity and emphasize his leadership. Traditional mistress for the Burman still prevail among the ethnic group and especially among the Korean. Thus, when the Pelang conference was held in February 1947 with the objective of hearing the wishes of the frontier people and to determine whether or not they desire to join the new sovereign state Burma, the Koreans who were divided into two groups, those who supported the AFPFL and those who favor a complete separation from Burma, attended the conference only as observer. Meanwhile, the other minority demanded statehood for the Shan, Qin, and Kachin. After a series of negotiation, the Pelang Agreement was signed on 12 February without the Korean. And yet when he gave his speech, Aung San still emphasized his dream of a unified and free Burma and said, in the past, we shouted slogan, our race, our religion, our language. Those slogans have gone obsolete now. He gave some example of how different races were living in harmony in other countries and continued that we will have our differences. But to take an example, if we are threatened with external aggression, we must fight back together with resolute will. The supreme commander of the army forces may be a Karen, a Kachin, or a Chin, but we must all rise and fight under his leadership. The Pelang Grimus was the basis for the formation of Union of Burma as a result of Aung San's dedication and determination. For that, he is regarded as the founding father of the Union of Burma. After unifying the people of Burma and establishing agreement with the leaders of Burma's ethnic groups, Aung San turned his attention to the election for the Constituent Assembly. 
which was one of the final steps remaining before complete independence. The tragic assassination of Aung San on July 1947 left the people of Burma to celebrate their official independence on January 4, 1948 without Aung San, their founding father, and to use the Indian Prime Minister Nehru epithet, the architect of Burma's freedom. It is undeniable that the name Aung San and Burma's independence cannot be separated. As a person from academia, I admire Aung San in his pursuit of knowledge. Since his teenage years, he read and serious books, and whenever he joined the school debates, he mentioned the names and the works of the leaders, including Abraham Lincoln, George Stevenson, and Jane Woods as example. I also admire his courage in trying to master the English language. According to his friend at the university, his English was clumsy and his speeches were incomprehensible. But knowing that English was an important medium to expressing his thought and ideas in a country of many ethnicity ruled by the British, he worked diligently to improve his English. Within three years, he became very successful as an editor of the university magazine, where the contributors were highly intellectual journalists, professors, and politicians. This proved his intellectual strength of having a wide knowledge with good command of both English and Burmese. From a political perspective, he was indeed an effective revolutionary leader, but it is difficult to say whether he could have saved Burma from the economic vicissitude that have occurred since independence. Could Burma now look like India, Malaysia, Singapore, Australia, or Pakistan if she had stayed in the British Commonwealth of Nations? We do not know and can only guess. Cooperation with England may have been more economically and military beneficial than total rejection of the British based on a radical political idea. Perhaps if he could have persuaded his AFPFL leaders to stay in the British Commonwealth instead of complete independence, Burma's destiny could have been different. Regarding his personality, I agree with a friend who opined him as being in a constant struggle between idealism, which is freedom from Great Britain, and pragmatism, using this group to other to attain his idea. His charm, academic savvy, and availability place him in leadership roles during his student days. He used these tools to move into leadership roles in political structures. Aung San was used by the Japanese to attain the gold, and at that point, he saw pragmatism at work. Aung San used that pragmatism to ally with the British to get rid of the Japanese. He allied with the communists to get rid of the British. Then he allied with the ethnic minority to take the accepted council. He was saying the right things publicly about his ideal freedom for, from Britain. But in conferences and daily conversation, he was charming, compromising, and cooperative. Like all other human beings, Aung San was not free from mystic. He trusted his people too much and seemed to be overconfident of their loyalty. He was informed of the stolen weapons, but he was not vigilant. Or perhaps his focus was entirely on the final step of the building of the Union of Burma, that he neglected the security matter. This lack of precaution caused his and the lives of his cabinet members. The country almost collapsed, and he missed seeing the independence Burma that he dedicated his whole life to realize. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angeline. That was absolutely fantastic. As I said, that I've had the privilege of, of reading your lecture yesterday. But thank you very much. I'm sure everyone who's watching and listening uh, would have learned a great deal. Um, I'm now going to invite uh, Professor Michael Charney. Uh, <coughs> Professor Michael Charney is, 
in the Department of History and the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy at the School of Oriental and African Studies here at, in London, and is a specialist in the history of Southeast Asia. He's the author of A History of Modern Burma, which was published in 2009, and more recently, Imperial Military Transportation in British Asia, Burma 1941-42, which was published in 2019. Michael joins us from Thailand, where it's very late. So, Michael, thank you very much for joining oh, us. Thank you. And, and um, Angeline, uh, and just to announce for the benefit of the audience that please do feel free to ask any questions that you may have um, in the, via the chat box function of the... Um, um, of the YouTube channel, and uh, we will take them up. But until then, Michael. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, so there's, there is much in the paper on, on which to agree with the speaker. Aung San struggled between idealism and prag pragmatism, and he wasn't perfect. He was a product of the confusing array of political models avail available in the 1930s, most of which, importantly, had not actually anywhere been used in liberating the country in, in the colonial world successfully. Scholars often weigh heavily the wisdom of Aung San's political choices, but when we look at the colonial world through Aung San's eyes, at the time he was making decisions, none of these colonies had achieved independence yet, and when they did, beginning in August 1945 with, with Vietnam and, uh, and uh, Indonesia, he had already cast his political dice in Burma. And when he was assassinated shortly after, only two years after actually, his death put Burma at a huge disadvantage not because he would have been able to solve all of Burma's problems had he lived, but that Burma lost the vision behind the momentum putting one particular plan into action. Burma afterwards meandered into independence on an old itinerary in the hands of leaders who never really understood the choices being made. The trajectory regarding relations with minorities went from hopeful to worse, and again, even had he lived, these relations might have soured. The biggest problem is with, with or without Aung San's death, Burma faced a number of problems that helped to ensure that almost any government would have failed once independence was, was, was achieved. It might be suggested that had the British put up more of a fight actually to prevent Burmese independence, it would have been better in the long run for Burma. Had they done so, Burma would have benefited from the revolutionary solidarity that Vietnam and other countries benefited from and might have led to stronger bonds being forged between the different ethnic groups against the common enemy. However, this can be dismissed by considering that the British would have, would have wound up dividing and ruling again. They would have allied with some of the ethnic races, just as the Dutch did in Indonesia, against the majority population, and we would have wound up with an earlier civil war. Aside from the ethnic time bomb, there were also economic problems. The British returned after the war, aided British companies, but never really fixed the infrastructure to its pre-war level. And the country, it is rarely noted, while its economy had shrunk, had seen its population and the number of mouths to feed grow dramatically from 1942. And most importantly, just about the only thing that was organized effectively and continued to become better organized, efficient, and stronger in the first decade of independence was the army backed by um, uh, very strong state security laws that were inherited from the, uh, the British. So the question I really have is, had Aung San lived, would Burma in the 1950s have wound up any differently? Would we have gotten to 1958 and had a successful democratic government that was able to resist uh, military control? Could Aung San, who had helped to found the, the Communist Party in Burma before the war, which emerged as a key ideological civil war enemy of the government, the same Aung San who had selected the good-hearted but indecisive who knew as his deputy, the same Aung San who had flip-flopped from seeking Chinese Kuomintang help to Japanese imperial help at the beginning of the war, and the same Aung San who had pushed for independence, which arguably should have waited for a few more years to iron out domestic relations before independence, would this Aung San have been a success in the 1950s? Or was Aung San an ideal, ideal revolutionary leader, but a poor architect of, of a new country? Was he a gifted visionary or merely a lucky political gambler? Although this, this might be an unhappy, unhappy un, and unpopular view, I'm not sure. And I think there's a lot of room to suggest that even were Aung San the best possible leader for newly independent Burma, that the problems it faced dealt, dealt mentally, politically, ethnically, were so great that no one, not even he, would have succeeded in overcoming them. We do not know what the challenges facing Burma would have done to his patients. Would he, 
as so many leaders do once they're in power, reveal other sides to their personality? Would they have become exhausted, uh, become a, a worse decision maker than they might otherwise have seemed to have become? Would he have succumbed to corruption? And I can imagine very easily a possible scenario when faced with hard decisions in a civil war that probably would have occurred anyway, where he too might have relied on martial law and the military after a decade of failure. Even the respected American leader, Abraham Lincoln, after all, did this in the American Civil War. Or would Aung San, the political wheeler and dealer, have taken up one side in the Cold War, leading to Burma's Civil War becoming a proxy war on the front lines of the struggle between the Soviets and the PRC with the U.S., perhaps a Vietnam before Vietnam. And for Aung San, however, we don't rate these questions. Like Elvis or John Lennon, he remains eternally youthful and blemished by the struggle to solve the problems that followed that others face with the tools he left them. He died too early. He died too young. But however unpopular this view, we can identify the roots of Burma's problems to this 1945 to 1947 period, when, to be honest, Aung San held the reins. I argue not that we demonize Aung San, but that we revisit this period not as the rise and loss of Aung San, but as the lost peace to the civil war and failed democracy that were to come. And to understand that when it comes to Burma's future, whether Aung San was a good or bad architect, that Mur Burma might have been doomed anyway, and for reasons that had much more to do with Britain and with Japan, than they did with uh, with Aung San and uh, and Wu Song. Hey, those are my initial comments. Um, if we don't have uh, uh, any questions that have popped up, maybe Angeline can respond to that. I understand this is going to be an unpopular view. I'm just trying to critically approach um, uh, uh, this. Uh, we don't, Michael, we don't have any questions at the moment, uh, but Angeline, if you would like to respond to several of the points that, that Michael makes, and and Michael, yes, if it is an unpopular view, don't worry, you've said it already, so um, <laughs> yeah. there you go. Uh, Angeline, would you like to, to respond to what I think is the moot question, which is, had Aung San lived and, and lived into the 1950s, would the situation have been different? Uh, that's one. And the other is that, is, is it correct to, to presume or, or to think or to argue that uh, Burma would have uh, gone into a, a, a civil war and, and, and a collapse of, of various sorts, uh, the, the roots of which, of some of which can be traced to the period of 1945 to 1947, when Aung San was very much not only in, in control, but quite dominant as well. Well, it's uh, quite a hard question to answer uh, yeah. because uh, since we all know that Aung San was the most popular leader during the time this, of his death and uh, many questions like uh, Dr. Michael Shani asked, there were many people asking such questions almost all the time I heard about that. And one thing is that, you know, like I said, uh, he was able to capture the heart of the minority, all these people, and then he promised them to give uh, within 10 years, if they, they don't trust him, that what he, that he was doing, uh, he will give them the secession from Burma, right? The Union of Burma to uh, separate themselves and uh, establish the state, you know? uh, and he agreed with that. So uh, that's why all the Chin, Gachin all joined him except the Korean, because the Korean were like, you know, since a very early period, they were fighting for their own Korean state. So that issue will continue because even during his lifetime, uh, when he was alive, uh, between the British government, Aung San himself and the Korean, they keep on uh, discuss this matter and Aung San went to all these leaders and talked with them. And some of them were very close to Aung San. So uh, they want to be with uh, Burma. So we cannot come to a conclusion that whether with, if Aung San were alive, the situation could be different or there would be no civil war during the 1949. So there, but uh, from my perspective, I would say that, you know, uh, if Aung San were alive, he said that he was not going to play the politics, you know, he wants to be, not be in the, he wants to be a writer. 
because he said that after independence, the Burmese politics will be a, a sort of conflicts among the leadership. So he said that uh, to refer to my you know, uh, book here, I, I, I give a conclusion here that you might uh, find here that he said that, you know, he said he was not you know, suited for the kind of political existence that after independence, he said that life after uh, independence, he was a, uh, he would leave political politics and live a quiet life as a writer because he felt that Burmese politics after independence would be based on political rapport defaults. And he concluded that he was not suited for the kind of political existence. So we don't know if he was going to continue as a political leader or just to lead a quiet life. But only thing I know that the minority who joined him at Penlong Conference, they sincerely believe him and they join him. That's why even after his death, like uh, Chin leader, you know, uh, Wang Kufu, and also Chin leader, Samasu in Wanao, they all cooperated with Gunu. And, and they went, even the, the country was almost collapsed in 1949, they still supported the Gunu you know, FPL party and tried to cooperate with him. Okay, so uh, I cannot give the right answer about this and like everybody, uh, because the situation was so different and the communists, there's all the communists and ethnic minority except the Chin, the Kachin Karen all you know, joined the, in, the revolution against the but, uh, Burmese government in the 1949. So uh, uh, we don't know if Aung San Awa alive, he could resolve this issue, we are not sure, okay? So I don't know how to answer that question, but all I can see is according to his you know, uh, last word, uh, he said that he didn't want to be in this political situation, he wanted to be a writer. I, I think we can agree, obviously, actually on a lot of things, but we can we can definitely agree that the 1950s would have been a big problem for any leader had they been in, pl been, been in place. And I do agree that Aung San was probably best suited of those available um, to be a leader in the 1950s. But there there is this problem, and I, I don't know how it emerges uh, amongst Burmese leaders, but they... They seem to want to, maybe it comes from uh, from monastic influence on the Mara Buddha's culture or something else, but they they have a, a dream, because Unu had that too, of a constant desire to step down from politics and leave it to somebody else. Um, so it's, it's hard to see anybody really coming up with durable leadership throughout the 1950s that would have got Burma through. And if we can agree on that, that there would have been no Burmese leader who could have done that then we just have to say that from the colonial period, the way the British had set up and left Burma or the impact the Japanese had, that Burma was, was going to be, was on a trajectory for being an economic and political and, 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 and otherwise mess from the 1950s anyway. Um, it, but if that's the case, you know, like we, we have to think, were there any other options other than military rule? And I don't say this to defend military rule. And I don't say this, that it was, they wound up producing a worse mess than already existed. But, we, and we don't have a crystal ball, we can't know for sure, but it's very hard to see if we had an alternative history, what would have fixed Burma in the 1950s? You know, this is about 75 years after independence. It looks like from the very beginning, the one of the worst chapters, the, the, the beginning of that story starts with disaster and Arctic, you know, and it never gets any better. The book never resolves itself. Well, I, one thing that I want to uh, you know, uh, 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 talk about Aung San's uh, role in a way that he uh, never encouraged uh, religion as a matter in politics, right? Since yeah. he was young, he was against uh, Buddhist monk involvement in politics. And uh, when, uh, after you know, independent, he was not there. But the way that later leader began to try to make Buddhism as a state religion, actually that, mm -hmm. caused, yeah. that caused the people began to have distress in uh, UNU policy. Right, that's one main reason that the country, the uh, minority group, asked for secession after ten years. 
So yeah. that's uh, if only he were alive, that this matter probably won't wouldn't uh, have uh, occur. So at least probably uh, we uh, the political situation could be more stable. From my perspective, I feel like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you mean the political situation could be more stable in the 1950s? Yes, did because uh, because uh, uh, after independent, uh, when during the parliamentary government, the uh, state UNU tried to introduce uh, Buddhism as the state religion, right? So it was a time that uh, there was like argument in the parliament that you know uh, for secession from the Kachin and Chin, all these representatives they began to talk about Shan, especially you know they start to talk about these things. So it is like you know. They didn't believe in the political, you know, uh, uh, policy of the time. Yeah. Um, do you think uh, I'm just pushing Michael's question forward? Do you think that had yeah. Hong Kong not been assassinated when he was, um, Unu would st still had a chance to become the leader, or would it naturally have been that Hong San would have emerged as the leader of independent Burma? Even though uh, you know, he said he wanted to be a writer, stay away. He has the he is a, a very patriotic person, right? So he is a, like all whole life. He is a nationalist. He wants the country to be unified. So he wouldn't look at this situation like the uh, revolution uh, in a very because among the army, even the leader, uh, he agreed to appoint all these current leaders like a. Uh, 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 commander in chief of Burma army was a current, and also in the navy and all the air force also these were current. He agreed with uh, Mountbatten in a Gandhi conference during the Gandhi conference, and he agreed that okay, we will keep all this. Even in his speech, he said that if the uh, army commander is a milit uh, a chin or a chin or current, we will follow his leadership. He declared it very clearly. So. I believe that he uh, will still try to unify the country the way that he could before. That's why I feel that his leadership will be um, very effective and we would be able to, uh, you know, uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, stop some of the you know, uh, uh, revolution of that time. Michael, we have a, Michael, we have a few questions. So if you just oh yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. If you just hold on to your thoughts, and I think yeah. Angeline should be given the time to take a yeah, sip. Of course. Yeah. Um, um, but we have a few questions. I'll read one, and then uh, we can uh, we can take. Then Michael, you can come in um, next. But I have to say that before I ask the questions, I have to say that it's only just occurred to me that all three of us are historians, and three historians discussing hypotheticals is, is quite an interesting exercise, I realize. <laughs> uh, but there you go. So, Angeline, the first question is I will read it uh, word by word because I'm not going to paraphrase other people's questions. What lessons can ethnic groups in Burma today? learn from Aung San of Sen five years ago? Can you repeat the question, please? What lessons can ethnic groups in Burma today learn from Aung San of 75 years ago? Oh. Well, Aung San want to unify the whole country. He was the person, like I said, the first Burman politician who concerned for the uh, minority. That's why he asked for all the minority to join together. And I feel that, you know, he encouraged the people to understand what is unity mean, to be united together, live inside together. From my uh, research, Actually, I read when I did my research in uh, uh, 1980s, you know, when I did my PhD, I went through a, a document saying that actually Don Aung San wanted to be in the Commonwealth of Nation before independent, he wanted to be, but he has the, the pressure from his colleagues that finally he had to give up his, you know, uh, you know this uh, 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 notion of 
becoming a Commonwealth of Nations because there many of his colleagues were against it. So finally, he gave in and he joined it. Actually, one of his, uh, I read in one, I don't remember, but I read in one of the paper that he even wanted to uh, build like United States of America, United States of Indochina. You know, he wanted to unite everybody. And one thing is that the young generation, they need to know that, understand what is federated state. They didn't have the good idea of federated state that time that they said, oh, we want our own independent, our own state. Actually, federated state, if only the Burmese leader also that time understand what is federated state, they would, you know, uh, open to that uh, argument and they would pro probably would accept it because when we talk about federated state, they still believe that it is pro-British. Actually, federated state is different. So that's why they, these uh, today, like the question that uh, somebody asked, if we uh, look at Aung San, we should try to understand or to encourage education because only you acquire knowledge like Aung San, you read all the uh, historical, you know, uh, I mean, the leadership who were really model for the you know, development of the country, unity of the people for democracy, only then uh, we can, you know, especially Aung San really love democracy. He wants everybody to work together and united and to uh, build a, uh, a country that everybody has rights, you know, and, and equal rights. That's why we need to, what major, I think, lesson from Aung San is to really uh, go for democracy. Okay, I'm just going to push this question a bit more, but this is my question, so I have no problems in saying that 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 it is my question. Um, you wrote a biography of Aung San, in, which was published in 2001, and a little over 20 years later, you've written a history of the Karen people. And I was wondering um, whether when you were researching and you wrote the history of the Karen people, which is 20 years after you'd written the biography of Aung San, has your opinion about Aung San changed in any way now that you have studied uh, the Karen people and their history in so much of depth? So the Karen people and Aung San in relation to the Karen people, has your opinion of Aung San changed in any way? If you had the chance, would you go back and rewrite some parts of the earlier book? Yes, I did. I In my new book, I give more details about Aung San and the current leaders, their meeting after meeting, how Aung San went to these people and like uh, uh, Baoji and uh, all the you know, uh, current leader of that time, uh, he had meeting after meeting. And he always, um, when he talked to the British uh, 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 no, uh, governor or the uh, cabinet member or leaders, he always mentioned about current surfer during the Japanese occupation. That's why he talked about this thing. And as uh, uh, he has some colleagues also like uh, Buleya uh, and like uh, other people who keep uh, who has open minded uh, uh, for the current people to uh, to be cooperated and to work together but the problem was you know the current uh, that time one group asked for the uh, current state that including the area of you know uh, like uh, Erawadi area and all the lower burma where major seaport you know and so for them, it is important to get because a current a live in many um, majority live in Delta area, uh, in addition to the Eastern uh, Thai border. The, 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 but the problem was if uh, the, uh, the, the British said, if they give that to the current, it will be insult to the Burmese because actually there were many Burmese in that area living in that area as well. So the British were also in dilemma. So Aung San tried to talk to the current uh, uh, leaders and one group was with Aung San, they trust Aung San because like So Jado and Sam Putin who tried to uh, contact uh, uh, Aung San uh, during 1943. Actually not So Jado, actually Sam Putin because during the um, uh, incident 1942, Myanmar incident, he went to Aung San after he had contact with a current uh, uh, agent with uh, Force 136. 
uh, Dr. Uh, you, we remember Major Seagram's long, uh, father long leg book talk about uh, Force 126 Major Seagram sent Upola to the Delta area and Upola had contact with Samputin. That's why uh, Samputin uh, met with Pola and went to Aung because Aung San wanted to uh, uh, no, uh, resist the uh, uh, Japanese. So that's why he got the information. They got contact through this Samputi, and then he formed the BNA, uh, BDA, you know, BDA, Burmese Defense Army, with a branch that he formed only for the current people. And that army, uh, uh, the current group of people, they joined the uh, Aung San BNA. And then this group was sent, even some of them were sent to, current people were sent to India for training and came back and parachute. You know, to, they came back to Burma for the resistance against the British. So this group trusts Aung San very much. And many Korean joined because So Jadu, who was the ex-British officer, very respected by the Korean people, was the leader of that um, BNE army branch. So that, that uh, BNE uh, was mostly Korean people. And one of them later became even a, uh, the uh, president of Burma, the third president of Burma who joined the uh, uh, Aung San BNE army. So this group, Samputi and this Maui Mao, this group, they wanted to so they cooperate with the AFPFL and but uh, the other group, they want complete independence. They want to have their own current state. So that's why Aung San went to this meeting and tried to explain that he cannot give this as his own personal you know, uh, agreement. But uh, uh, through the constituent assembly and through the parliamentary democracy, you know, all these uh, British uh, through the agreement with the uh, discussion, negotiation with the British, he could have this thing, he said like that. So that's why he tried to work hard. But like I said, he, he is a very, you know, idealistic at the same time, pragmatist, right? So we can see that we don't know where sometimes he gives straight answer to the Quran. That's why many Quran believe him. But some still wanted to, because the pressure from the other Korean also that the people still want to have the Tanesrim and Delta area region. That's why uh, uh, we can see it's a quite a complicated issue at that time. But in uh, all the record talk about Aung San was quite sincere in trying to negotiate with the Korean leaders. And we can see that he agreed to a point, you know, when uh, Mountbatten asked him to uh, ask uh, a DIG, they are not in Brigadier General in Burma Army, they were going to form. The Korean leader, Socha, do become the uh, DIG, one of DIG and uh, Budaya was one of them. So two, one Korean and one, you know, Burman. So uh, he tried to be fair to the, you know, and when he reformed the Burmese army, he allowed the all, all, all the uh, Korean um, uh, you know, uh, officials who were uh, in the Burmese, uh, in the British army to join and continue their, uh, their, their role in the their position also. Did I answer your question? Sure. Michael, do you want to come in? I have a couple of more, uh, more questions, but you can come in now if you want to. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I'll mean, i make a quick point. One of them, and this is a, you mentioned we're historians, this is one of the historical problems dealing with Aung San, is he belongs to one period at the end of one period. So he really belongs to the decolonizing in Southeast Asia period before the Cold War. And we have to judge, well, how would he have done during the Cold War, which of course begins after he died. And we look across Southeast Asia and we look at all the other state builders at that time. If we look at Sihanouk and uh, Sukarno and Ziem and all these other people who were all clever idealists, but also pragmatists, who were, all of them wound up either dead or deposed or out of power. So I, I have, regardless, we, we can see that a lot of the problems that Burma faces in the 1950s come from this colonial period. But actually, regardless of that, the, in, in Aung San dealing with lot, all these things, I think that there's a very high likelihood he wouldn't have survived politically the 1950s because of the way that the Cold War worked in the region. 
Angeline, do you think that had Aung San lived, he would have survived the 1950s or would not have survived the 1950s, the way in which the Cold War eventually evolved? That one, I, I'm not sure, uh, but I know that he always tried to support uh, Vietnam, you know, tried to support Ho Chi Minh's um, movement for independence, because for him is what Ho Chi Minh movement was for independence, not against uh, uh, you know, imperialism, I mean, not against uh, any other nation, but his own uh, way that when in India, uh, when he was met with journalists and he was asked, will you support you know, Vietnam, uh, Ho Chi Minh's movement? He said, I like to support, but I need to uh, help my own country first because charity begin at home. So, because we are not even having our independence yet. So how can I help you know, Vietnam? So for in his own mind, he always think about the unity of the country, the stability of the country, the birth, to have Burma as a uh, very unified and uh, you know, uh, uh, political stable country uh, to build democratic society in Burma. So uh, for the neighboring country, he, like he said, he tried to talk to like Gina, even although the Muslim League was uh, the opposition, uh, no, uh, opposite to the you know, uh, Indian National Congress, he still tried to uh, uh, very uh, deal very in a very diplomatic way, right? So, and about whenever asking, he was asked about neighboring country, he always said that he support all these movement, like Ho Chi Minh movement, he supported it. So if, if he survived, if he lived during the Cold War, I think he will still uh, support Ho Chi Minh. And the uh, the uh, uh, no, democratic world would think of him as a communist as well. I think, yeah. although he actually he always declared that he is not a communist. You know, he tried to make sure that he uh, in the beginning he uh, liked certain ideas of communism, but not to the extent, you know, to the extreme extent. That's why he split with the communist leader of when he uh, uh, was the leader of the uh, anti uh, no, AFPFL. But you think that he himself would have survived the Cold War? Politically? Well, uh, he is quite diplomatic. So he might talk to the you know, American uh, leaders and the uh, you know, democratic world. He tried to talk and will really try to probably would try to appreciate or uh, negotiate and try to be like a negotiator between these and uh, between these opposite you know, uh, parties, I think. It okay. might survive. <laughs> okay, uh, we have, uh, I'll take the next question, um, which is also a bit of a what if question. Um, sorry, I'm trying to read this. If the assassination did not happen, uh, how would Aung San have incorporated the Panglong Agreement and the issue of frontier er areas in post-colonial constitutional developments? Panglong Agreement was signed before he died and he was working for the constituent assembly and then the, for the election where all these minority you know uh, all leaders can join as well that's why uh, that question i think it is uh, already discussed i think that you know the the penal agreement was signed by even the leaders that Aung San agree with so uh, he will continue that uh, now agreement, follow that Penal agreement, and try to cooperate with all these minority leader to try to build better relationship with them. And that's why I said that in 1949, uh, the whole country or the civil war probably could be protected. I think. Um, okay. Uh, next question is. What, in which, I think what is meant is direction, although the word used is situation. So in which direction do you think Aung San was planning to lead his organization, AFPFL, 
after the British left. After, you mean after independence, if he were alive? Okay. Yes. Actually, AFPF, uh, even before the British left, he tried to, uh, you know, uh, stop the communist, the extreme communist leader. And he just, you know, disassociated himself with them. And, you know, even uh, uh, he, like, he tried to clear all the you know, extremists from his from this AFPFL. That's why uh, just after his death, the the communists, uh, the all the even the Kinsu left AFPFL earlier because he expelled all these you know communist uh, extremists, and that's why the AFPFL was only with the other you know. Uh, uh, like those who agree with him, that there is not extremists and they were not communists or, you know, extreme, you know. Uh, uh, that's one thing that he was assassinated, actually, because uh, we, if you, uh, if we read the uh, uh, Aung San Adli agreement, before that, actually, when Adli and Aung San were in negotiation, uh, Uso and his group, you know, tried to uh, negate that uh, uh, agreement. They tried to stop that, and uh, they were uh, claiming that uh, the Kamsan didn't uh, no, represent them. So they had to resolve that issue. So we can see that Aung San uh, Uso was already you know, against Aung San since then. So he tried to, uh, he became quite uh, you know, the major leader in AFPFL. You can see that all his uh, rivals like even the Communist Party all were expelled already that time. Okay, uh, I have to say we are beginning to run out of time now. Uh, Michael, do you, would you like to say anything else, make any comment? Um, no, I mean, uh, I, again, because Aung San was assassinated at the beginning of the period that we're looking at, uh, everything we say has to be looked at through I don't know, you can't use crystal ball as a metaphor here, but, you know, through an alternative time frame. Uh, so the, um, uh, I think that the AFPFL uh, under Aung San uh, would have had to be completely reorganized. You, you couldn't have the umbrella party like this really maintaining order with all the tensions that were going on even by the late 1940s. So something would have changed in that regard, but... Um, but but again, I think that they probably even the the I think that okay, if I could put it historically and in alternative terms of alternative history, one of the things that UNU was desperate to do was to prevent Burma's domestic problems and its civil war from intersecting with the Cold War. Um, I don't know how Aung San would have responded to that. UNU responded to this mainly by default by trying to avoid things where he could, um, but really just leaving the, things to the hands of fate. Uh, Aung San would have tried to fix the situation, which I think would have been the the worst thing he could have done in the Cold War context of the 1950s. Um, I think certainly, as uh, Angeline has mentioned, uh, if he was going to wind up supporting the Viet, I mean, you can imagine if he wound up supporting the the Viet Minh in, in Indochina, uh, what the U.S. would have done relative to Burma uh, and the different ethnic minorities would have had the uh, the CIA and uh, special forces and in Kremland and Shan states and in Rakhine, and, and that would have just torn Burma apart. It would have been the a much larger version of Laos, I think. Um, so, I my final take. I mean, I can see why people might think that Aung San would succeed through the 1950s, but I think that uh, Aung San would would not have survived the 1950s, and it would be or early 1960s, and that would have been largely because of the Cold War. And that would have been partly because with, we know about his personality, how he would have tried to fix Burma's problems. And they were the Cold War tensions were just too great for anybody to play wheeler and dealer at that level and live. One, uh, from one perspective, we can look at Aung San's relationship with Mountbatten. Louis Mountbatten was very personal, very close. He protected Aung San from all kind of uh, accusation, atrocity, uh, the, uh, from even murder case. He tried to he even warn people that if you were against my, you know, uh, uh, against Aung San, he will even 
code marshal, something like that during time. So they are very close. So probably Britain, America relationship was so good that time. So Aung San might talk to Mountbatten about the situation and try to probably will be able to from my perspective, I mean, able to uh, you know, uh, deal with Ho Chi Minh and they will have a, 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 a like a, a sort of uh, you know, a cordial rapport and they can build up something that they can uh, uh, probably, they can stop the escalation of this uh, Cold War, I suppose, you know, in Southeast Asia. Anyway, okay. that's my yeah. opinion. <laughs> sure, sure, thank you. Uh, we are here to hear your opinion, so, so uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, we, uh, we have one more question uh, that I'm going to ask uh, and then ask both of you to make any closing remarks if you would like to. But before that, uh, a question that I have, and it came back to me in different ways, is political assassinations are not new to South Asia. You've had political assassinations in Bangladesh, in India, in Pakistan, in Sri Lanka, and this one as well. Uh, is there any clarity about why Aung San was assassinated? Yes, according to record, it was Uso who expected that he would be uh, no, given the opportunity once Aung San and his cabinet is gone, he will be the most popular one to be elected. That's why he tried to arrange this assassination and you know, make it like it is uh, like seems like British were doing this, you know. So that's why he tried. But the everybody, uh, I mean, the uh, intelligence was so good that they found out immediately it was Uso. So actually, through their personal vendetta as well, because in there was some uh, you know, assassination against Uso. So Uso thought that it was arranged by Aung San. So that's another. And also the grudge that he had during the Aung San Adli agreement was another one, right? So uh, the accumulation of all these things that led to the assassination by Uso. Um, yeah, uh, could I add that, of I course, so some, some, Bur some Burmese at the time, and I think even later still believe that it was the British who had, uh, had arranged for that. but. But the evidence we have certainly indicates, and, and it seems very logical that it would have been who saw. Um, yeah, is there, I mean, sorry, were you going to say anything? But I mean, it is a curious phenomenon how common um, political assassinations have been in the region. I don't know about Southeast Asia, but in South Asia, at least as I said, um, you know, there have been several and there have continued to be even into the eighties and the nineties. Uh, Rajiv Gandhi was assassinated in India in 1992, if I'm not mistaken, um, 1991. Um, and um, so, so that was the reason I, I, asked, I asked the question. Uh, one last question for you, Angeline. Um, what is Aung San's legacy in the context of today's Myanmar or even otherwise? Aung San legacy, as we all call today, like the name that uh, Nehru gave him, uh, and uh, we can also from the newspaper that uh, among the other, you know, uh, obituary, the you know ne uh, Nehru gave him as the freedom, you know, uh, architect of Burma freedom. That was his legacy, and we all know that today his daughter followed his step and even said that she is trying to build a new Burma, right? So uh, independent Burma. So uh, that is, we can say that that's his legacy. Great, thank you very much. Um, Michael, would you like to say anything by way of conclusion? Oh, I, I, I disagree with that. I mean, I agree with that, uh, that that's his legacy and um, he's the founder. And, um, but part of the legacy too is there's often questions because he died young and because it happened, be, you know, uh, uh, relatively early in the uh, well, even before they had full independence, there are often questions about you know like what Aung San would have wanted or what he had planned, and so I think that not only did he leave the legacy of being the founder, they continued to. Is the, we just don't know what he would have done actually because he was killed so early. 
Sure. Uh, Michael, we lost you a bit towards the end because of, of broadband, but, but I think we all got the gist of what you were saying. Angeline, you have the last word. I, Is there anything you want now to say? I can hear. I can hear you now. Earlier yeah. I can hear. Yeah, now I can hear. Well, I was yes. saying you have the last word. So is there anything you'd like to say by way of ending this? No, I, ha I'm, uh, I have nothing to say, but thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I'm glad to hear a lot of question, discussion uh, that uh, sometimes I can't answer, but it's a really, you know, uh, glad to hear that people are interested in talking about this topic. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, as, I, as I say, uh, at the end of all the events that we do online, you know, if there's been any positive outcome of, of the COVID pandemic, it is that we've all become more tech savvy and are able to do these online events, which allows all of us to convene and curate panels like this, which today, for instance, is literally spread across, across the globe. Angeline, you're in the United States, I'm in London, and Michael is in Thailand, and it wouldn't have been possible um, before the pandemic. Uh, and, and I'm very, very grateful on behalf of the LSE South Asia Centre to both of you. We can't do these events unless academics and experts like the two of you give freely of your time and your intellect for the benefit of everyone. So once again, Angeline Noor, Professor Emerita in History at Judson University, and Michael Charney, Professor in the Department of History and the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy at SOAS. Thank you very much and goodbye.